Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Unlocking the Power of You. I am Timothy White, Sr., and in the studio today, we have a guest, Miss Gwendolyn Mall, and she will be introducing herself along with Mr. Art Finley. He's always around. He's always here. But we want Gwen to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about you before we tackle this subject again on bullying. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for having me here this afternoon, this uh, cold afternoon here in Cleveland. My name is Gwen Mall, and I am a lifestyle entrepreneur and a uh, vegan chef and a uh, mom of an amazing six-year-old daughter. That's it? That's it. No, that, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's a lot that's a lot because of being so a mom. There's so many things involved within lifestyle, being an, a lifestyle entrepreneur. Um, so I have a company called Weekend Vegan that I uh, produce vegan meals and sea moss drinks and gels for whomever like them. Um, I also design uh, crochet berets, which are for people who either have thinning, baldness, or have alopecia, and it is, um, primarily it is hair that is attached to a, bro a beret or a turban. And I also design earrings that are intentional, and they help you uh, stay present in the things that you have intentionally created for your life. And so that, in, an, in a nutshell, is what the meaning of me being a lifestyle entrepreneur is about. And being a mom of a six-year-old named Jason is a whole lot. So <laughs> that I homeschool and uh, take very good care of. So I think that 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 pretty much sums it up. <laughs> well, that's a lot of work when you think about being a parent. Either yeah. way it goes, Absolutely. there's a lot that it goes in, into that. And Mr. Finley, since we, you weren't here with us last week on the air, but behind the scenes, tell a little, a little bit more about yourself. And then we're going to tackle this issue of bullying because it's so relevant. Uh, my name is Art Finley. I'm sales and marketing director for Tim White Publishing Company. Uh, a little bit about my background. It's a pleasure working with a couple of Fortune 500 companies and also a minority-owned business. Um, and also, too, a fact that I've developed a, a business of my own, Finley and Associates. But my association here now is with Tim White Publishing Company. So happy to be here. And one other thing I'd like to add about Miss Maul, she's a singer. She's an entertainer. Also, you weren't going to say that, please. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> well, well, you know what? As I said, we're, we're moving on with this. But yes, why didn't you tell us a little bit about the, well, the fact that you were a singer as well? Because I wanted to focus on the things that I am currently doing. doing? Yeah. And so singing, of course, is my blood. A lot of people know me from that aspect. and But currently... This is these three things are what I'm focused on. The three, four things that I mentioned are what I'm focused on. But you can always follow me at GwenMall.com and find out all the things that I'm doing and all the things, whether it's music, food, fashion, whatever, what have you. So I have a lot of things happening all the time. Okay. And then we will, uh, but you can always follow me and find out uh, what all is happening. Gwenmall.com. Oh, I see. I was going to ask you to repeat that yes. again, but you, you beat me to it. <laughs> Gwenmall.com. Yes. Okay. So everyone who is watching and listening, uh, you can contact Gwen or get with Gwen on her platform, her social media platform. So we'll look forward to you doing that. And today we're talking, we're going to continue talking about bullying. And we had a fantastic program last week and a tremendous uh, response. We want the same kind of response this week, but we're going to talk about something that is fresh. We want to address that elephant in the room, if you will. And the elephant in the room would be Mr. Art Finley. Nope. You're not the elephant in the room. We're talking about Derek Chauvin. Okay. We're going to talk about Derek Chauvin's. We know that if we don't talk about it, people are going to say you, all that bullying you've been talking about bullying and you didn't mention about him because that was a bully thing that happened. Absolutely. And since it was about bullying, we need to address the fact, number one, he's convicted. Absolutely. We don't know what the sentence is going to be yet. And that's something we have to really hold on to and wait. And prayerfully, it would be a, a long sentence. But in as much as he murdered somebody, and we know that that was a bullying mentality. And what we said the subject today was going to be talking about bullies with badges. 
And there are a lot of people we talk about all the time. So I would need for you guys to tell me, have you ever been stopped or you felt pressured or bullied by the police department or police in the department? I haven't personally felt that, um, but I know people who have. You know, I think any time the police come up behind you, your heart beats a little faster. You don't know what's going to happen in this climate, this day and age. We get a little bit... um, you know, fearful of that. We don't want to call the police when there's something going on now. People are saying that. We don't even want to involve the police, and that is a shame. Um, I think that um, I, because I haven't actually felt bullied from a police officer in that way, um, that doesn't mean I don't see it, we don't hear about it, and we don't experience it by way of other people. I think we're all connected. So when George Floyd experienced what he experienced, I think we all felt it in some particular kind of way and uh it's, it's horrible well now with what you just said we want to capitalize a little bit on that sure. because bullying you you've just mentioned you said we don't want to call the police we want don't want no. the police involved is that just because we're black people and we've had such a hard time with the police with the police uh white police black police or just police in general Well, let me start off by saying I have police officers and law enforcement officers in my family. So do I. So I don't believe that all um, officers and all police are bad. I think that we have a uh, there is a lack of education for um, either white or other races of police officers. And they just don't know how to handle black people in regards to like. In regards to, you know, coming up and and finding out what the issue is and talking to us in a particular kind of way, you know, you can incite a lot, you know, with your tone. And if you're not used to handling situations or people in a particular kind of way, you can escalate the situation when it doesn't need to be escalated. So that's what I mean when I say we don't typically want to. I'm not going to speak for anybody. I'm going to say I. I question whether or not I should call the police now. You know, should I call the police or should I just try to? you know, handle this situation on my own or in a different way? Or is there something else that I can do or is there somebody else I can call versus them? Okay, so that's a scary feeling to have for any of us to have when you don't want to call the police. Now, you're a little older and you should be familiar with it, I'm sure, like I am. As I grew up, police on the beat. You have police walking the street. Absolutely. So what is the difference now when you look at what's happening now and what happened when we were younger with police walking the beat? What made the big difference? I think what made the big difference is being able to communicate and see those particular policemen in the neighborhood. I know that when you would walk up, say, for instance, 140th and Kinsman and Union, there was a policeman there that you were always going to see so you could communicate with them. And he was going to let you know if it, what right and wrong was about. So you were being police. It's a different situation now is that individuals are usually out of your community and they're coming with you is that you may have an attitude. That's because you don't know me. Uh, I think what you need to do is once you find out who I am and how I carry myself, don't categorize people. That's the problem with ears like this here. If I see you and I say, oh, he's troubled. Approach that in a different manner. It's the mindset. Sure. And I think that's what they're talking about right now all around the country is that we have to change the mindset. Okay, with that being said, how do we, and Gwen, I saw you saying yes, you're in agreement. What's going to be necessary for us to help change the mindset? I agree with you because as a young child growing up in the city, we always saw the beat cop. We knew them by name. Right. And they knew us. So, what happened to that camaraderie? What happened to that that demeanor? And also, they used to have two party police cars back then too. And there was always another cop in the car with you. They went to this single cop in a car, and I believe it's making us more distant. Yes, I would yeah. agree. I would agree. I think that when you mentioned, you know, on the beat, the the cops that are the police officers that are on the beat, they had a um, a connection with the the community. Mm-hmm. They came out, they talked, they spoke, they played games, they, you know, made themselves visible, made themselves approachable. That's the other thing. When you put yourself in a I'm higher than, bigger than, over you, overseer kind of position, then you give people 
they're automatically on the defense. They're automatically, you know, colder. Um, so I think being a little – at this point, I don't know what can help it. I think being a little bit more approachable probably. But when you talk to police officers here, they're outside and, you know, different places, they seem to be pretty approachable. They seem to be pretty level-headed. They seem to be pretty – but it's – uh, when they're in the middle of an altercation or if they're, uh, you know, going to a call and they automatically draw their their weapon, you can't help but say, what happened to that approachability? What happened to that, you know, that, that, that calm demeanor? What happened to that? What is your training like? Let's start there, perhaps. What is the training like for police officers now? Is there a component that is teaching them how to talk to kids who play video games most of the time? Is there another language? Is there another way to speak to, you know, that group of, that dynamic? You know, I mean, that, that, that group of people. Is so, there a different way? So what you're saying is that there needs to be more personal involvement within the uh, policing community other than just, you know, most of the times when we interact with police is generally when something bad is happening. Oh, yeah. So how do we end that that mentality that the police should only show up when something's bad is happening. How do we get back to that position of talking to the police on a one-on-one -on -one and them feeling comfortable? But I know, and I, as the subject today is bullies with badges. A lot of them became bullies. Mm -hmm. They became bullies because they have that sense of, I have sole authority. And because of that, it causes us to fear them as well. And what you said earlier that fear, I don't know if I even want to call the police mm -hmm. because are they going to show up and listen? Right. Or are they going to show up and be bossy? Yeah. Or bully me? Right. All right. You yeah. have, you shake your head. What do you have to say? Now, oh, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the things you, you said right here is how you approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I have been taught is that show some friendliness. Good morning, officer. I uh, see a bunch of them coming into stores. How you doing? It's okay then. You can feel the seed. It's okay then. Let the tension level come down instead of saying, you know, yeah, or this cop, this here, this here and there. Bring to the table respect of yourself, and then hopefully you're going to get respect from them. Right. So there's that bully mentality then. How do we address the bully mentality? How do we, going back to what you're saying, how do we do that? I think there's there needs to be some type of sensitivity training with the officers. You know, when times change, they have to change with it, I believe. You know, you can't handle the same situation that you handled 10 years ago in the same way. You know, you have to approach it from a different standpoint. You have to find out, and here goes another aspect of it. If children are walking around and they are uh, eating a lot of sugar, if they're eating all the wrong foods, and their brains are not processing things appropriately, they're going to act out. And all you want to do is control them. And if all you want to do is control them and all they want to do is act out, then we have to handle this situation differently. We have to maybe look at it from a couple of different standpoints. One, the children need a different type of nutrition. The police officers needed a different kind of training to handle that kind of thing. Because now we have higher levels of autism. We have higher levels of mental disorders and all of the things, right? Absolutely. So we have to pay attention to that, and we have to make adjustments as, as that goes on. I don't know if police officers are getting that. I don't know if they're doing that. And so that puts us, if you're only going with your gun drawn, and you're not going to say, hey, let's talk about it. Let's find out what's going on. But you're only coming in like this, that's a problem. But see, I, I, it comes down to also the police, the thinking overall, some of them, is I don't have time for that. I don't have time to uh, be a mediator. I don't have time to be a social worker. That goes back to what people are talking about defunding the police because they're simply saying, hey, you're, not, you're coming with your guns drawn. Sometimes we don't even need the police to come to a situation or circumstance, but they come. But since they're not uh, social workers, they don't know how to work, work socially. And that may be a bit part of the bigger problem. Maybe they need to have some social uh, training in that way. You know, so, you know, it, if you have to be cross-trained in a position, 
and you have to be cross-trained to handle the stock room and you have to be cross-trained to handle the register and you have to be cross-trained to handle customer service, then so should the police officers. They should also have some type of cross-training to say to, to know there are different situations here. Everything that you show up to is not going to be exactly the same. Every black man that you see is not going to be aggressive. Every black child that you see is not going to, um, you know, is not in a, in a negative uh, situation, you know, in that way. So you have to handle it accordingly, and there needs to be training to help them figure that part out. So you're talking about training. There, again, is another we're going to keep opening up these cans sure. of worms after Which a while because necessary. when we think, when you think about it, children, as we said on the program last week, and we've said it time and time again, children are not originators, they're imitators. The children are getting fed information. Most of the time it's wrong information and misinformation. If the child is getting that kind of information and it grows up in them, then we have police officers, we have doctors, we have lawyers who have that. And going back to something you said, too, is, is just as important, too, is that nutrition. If we're out of sync biologically, we're going to be out of sync physically, emotionally. So many people will act out because of that. So people become bullies because they don't know, even at that point, that they lack proper nutrition. They don't know that, hey, I need to be taught how to be uh, respectful. Yes. They become bullies because of that. They act out because to them, they have no other option. Absolutely. And one of the things I like to, to go back to is that when touched on standardization of a program, no matter what size the city is, but get some standard programming and things that individual needs to do as far as police officers are concerned. I don't care if it's a major metropolitan or a city of 10,000 people. There should be a standard that you go by to be able to approach and deal with individuals. In the station sometime, maybe in the morning, maybe it's TV I'm watching. Let's go out and get the bad guys. Mm -hmm. See, so that mentality right there is mm -hmm. when I leave the police station, I'm going to sub smiles. Uh, I see this young lady speeding all over, and she may have an attitude. I got an attitude, mm -hmm. and I may not even realize. Mm -hmm. Why are you speeding? What's this here? Mm -hmm. Trying to get to get my daughter. She had an accident in school. And said, it's okay, then follow me. Let me turn on the lights and take you and to the school. Let's get there. Uh-uh. I'm going to stop you and put more stress on Well, I'm going to give you a ticket. Let me see if you have any warrants out on you. That's time. Yeah. You're worried about their daughter mm -hmm. or that child of yours. Right. So show some consideration on both ends. But standardization of a policy that's needed in this country. Well, if we look at standardization, we're simply saying it, across the board we're going to do this. There has to be flexibility yet. Even in that standardization, the flexibility means that, okay, every situation, going back to what you said moments ago, every situation is not going to be the same. And we need to approach it accordingly rather than approach that car and simply say, I'm the one, I'm the person in charge. I need to have a mindset of de-escalation rather than confrontation. Right. And most of the time that doesn't happen because it's not taught. And the police departments don't, and they've even admitted that there needs to be some retraining done because they believe in getting 140 hours training, you know, become a police officer. You go to become a cadet, you get the training, you know how to go out there and be the bad guy down, but you don't know how to go and deescalate a situation. So how do we deal with that? How do we uh, get people within the, the police departments and not only the police departments, I don't want to beat them up. Because the civilians, we do a lot. And I'm going to say this, too, as part of it. I have a list of 172 people who were killed by the police. It says here, unarmed, killed by the police. But I want to talk about this, too. This is bad. Mm -hmm. We need to address that. Mm -hmm. But I also pull up to some statistics from 2019 and 2020 where black people have killed black people. And I wrote it down. 16,000 and 40 uh, 16,084 deaths by black people Absolutely. killing black people. Mm -hmm. We are saying black lives matter, black lives matter to the police department. When are black lives going to matter to us? Mm. Very yeah. good point. You know, I feel like 
here's the thing. The topic in, in, right now is in regards to the police department. And like you said, you don't want to beat up the police department. We don't. We want to, you know, we want to respect all uh, law <laughs> enforcement. And we want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to make sure we, we're going and following the laws and doing all the things. That's a problem. That list. Yes, we have a, a black on black crime issue. We definitely do, and that's something that mm -hmm. we need. And that it stems from bullying, and it stems absolutely, from all absolutely the things. But when law enforcement is trained, supposedly, so I'd like to as you say trained, Tra supposed to be trained, <laughs> supposedly trained to handle specific kinds of situations. That's a problem, mm -hmm. and it is growing. It's not going away. We were one, two. Not even in a couple hours out of the uh, conviction. Mm -hmm. And we have a situation happening in Columbus where you can get out of your car and within 11 seconds, you're firing four shots. Do you have a taser? Do you have a baton? Do you have any type of anything else to de-arm or de-escalate or whatever the situation? Why is it that you always grab your gun and you shoot, then ask questions? You know, it, it goes back to something you said too earlier. We we have a mindset we don't even want to involve the police, and we try to do, handle things on our own. Some things we can't handle on our own. We need help. Absolutely. And that situation, this young lady was about to stab another young lady. Two people could have died. Mm -hmm. And I watched the video, and a young man is kicking a, uh, a teenage girl in the head like he's punting a football. And he didn't care whether the police was there or not. What has happened to our society and our culture when we don't care if the police are around us, we're going to still do the wrong, the wrong thing rather than the right thing. When is the re-education going to start? And not only when, but where is it going to start? We know the police needs re-educating. What about our children? What about our families? We need re-educating too because, as you mentioned, I can be afraid to see the police or even want to call the police. And they need to be on the scene at a particular time. And I don't even want to call them because I'm afraid if they show up, they might show up with a gun, a gun drawn. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's going on, but the gun is drawn. You like you want to say something, Art? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think it goes back to the fact that am I being taught to respect the individuals? First of all, I'll respect myself. Mm -hmm. And then when I get an opportunity to be out there to be able to respect an individual that has on his car to serve and protect. Um, you got to be able to bring that to the table. Uh, and it's a two-way street. We have to learn a two-way street. When we were coming up, you were taught to respect. You had no problem with calling police. Officer, excuse me, I'm having a problem here now. You don't do that because of, there's no respect. Respect has to come within the self and it has to be taught. And you have to see it. As you said before, we emulate what we see or don't see at home. I think, I think what we're, the, one of the major issues is that we're looking to place a particular right and wrong stamp on either. And there really isn't a right or wrong, right? I think everybody is accountable. Absolutely. That, I, I like that you said that because that's so hitting the nail on the head. Everybody is accountable. But I think that the onus is on the police department primarily because of this climate that we're in right now. They have been the aggressor in how many deaths, how many situations you have. It's a small book over there that you've printed out in regards to all of the deaths. And they're supposed to be the people we call to, to protect us. I agree. And we need to... We need to figure out how do we bridge that gap and in what way do we bridge the gap? We've been talking about de-escalation. We've been talking about defunding and so forth, but it's going to go back to, we need to really respect one another, but how do we get to that point of respecting one another? Cause if, if I don't respect you, I don't respect your life either. We have to, it starts at home. It starts at home. There are a lot of men missing from home. There are a lot of fathers missing from homes, and so there's a lot of extra stress that's put on um, women and mothers to police 
their children, to raise their children, to raise young men to become, you know, young boys to become men. That's not something that I think that we uh, we can do. We have done, but a man teaches a boy how to be a man. So you 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 know you're the perfect guest for today because you're saying the things we really need to address as well. Where are the men? Yeah. Where are the men? They're not in the house. They're not at home. A lot of children, these children need balance. Yes. They need the man and the woman sure. who can help balance at home and that situation and lifestyle. So where are they at? They're, they're, are they too busy to take care of their homes? Are they working so hard that they don't have time to do anything with their children at home? And their homes that have the men in the house, but they're not in the home. The bodies are there, but that's all that is there. So what do we do? Again, yes, we can offset much of the things that are going on in the community with the police and everywhere else. If not, and, and I know guys, going to watch the program, you're going to get upset. Men, you need to be available. You need to be at home. You need to be there as leaders to help guide. The woman, and my mother said this years ago to me because when I lost my wife, she said, now you're going to have to be uh, uh, the man and the woman. I said, Mom, God only created me to be a man. I can't be a woman. I can't do for my kids what a woman could do. I can be the best man that I can be. That's what's missing, and that's a key ingredient to everything that we're talking about right now. That bullying thing happens because something is happening in the homes, in that child's psyche, to make them feel that I have to go out and become abusive, whether it's physically, verbally, even biologically, because we, we get messed up in our head to go out and do things. So what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do and how are we going to get men more involved in making the change? Knowing it, knowing that is needed is not enough. So what do we do? Well, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Kevin Samuels at all, if you've heard of him or been a part of any of his broadcasts or anything on YouTube or Instagram, but he made a very good point. And um, some people can take offense to it because he's, he's very controversial, <laughs> but he said, close your legs, period. You know, stop birthing babies to men who can't be accountable and who aren't able to be, or to males who aren't able to be accountable and be a part of that child's life and rearing. Stop it. You know, we have to, as women, we have to allow uh, a man to be able to be a part of our children's and chi their child's life too. There's that component. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to, let's look at everything. There is no right or wrong, in my opinion. In relationships, it's about understanding. Uh, if we don't have an understanding, then what are we doing? We're missing a lot. So there are so many different layers. It starts at home. If it starts at home, then it starts at home with two parents. If it starts at home with two parents, then those two parents have to uh, create the right nutrition for the kids to have a balanced mind and a balanced emotional state. And then if you have a balanced mind and e emotional state, then you can learn. And you can learn. If you can learn and you can comprehend, then you can learn and comprehend that when you go into the world. So it's all of these particular layers. And once you go out into the world, you'll treat people the way that you want to be treated because you're being treated with respect and love and kindness at home. So it's a, it goes, you know, it's all of these things, right? So we're seeing so many breakdowns of this because there are a lot of people missing dads and good moms. Just because the mom is in the house doesn't make her a good mom. mom. No. So then there's that yin and yang that's missing. That balance is missing. And so um, for the ones you know, I don't know what the answers are, but I think I have a good idea of where they're starting. Well, you know, you, you've said it already where it starts. If it starts yes. at home, we just have to start building. And that's a process. Yes. See, we don't want to look at the process. We always want to look at the end, end result. result. The end result is because there's a process. What are we doing to help these children not become bullies? Whether And that's the thing, you're sitting here. There are women who are bullies, by the way, uh, audience, we next week we're going to have some a woman on who was a bully. So she's going to be talking about bullying from the female perspective, and we need that as well because men aren't only the, the only bullies out here. Yep. And we have people like a Derek Chauvin pop up because there's something in him. There was something in him that made him feel comfortable with doing what he did. Mm -hmm. 
And we, again, we look at the end result. It was murder, yes. But what brought him to that point that he felt comfortable with doing what he did? He's done some form or fashion of that before. Absolutely. And he's seen other people in his uh, department do the same thing that made it okay. This isn't, this wasn't new behavior. This mm-hmm. wasn't an act of defense. He wasn't trying to do anything to, you know, uh, he was proving a point. To this black man and all of the black and brown children in that area to let them know this is what's going to happen to you if you don't do what I tell you to do and not now but right now period and to uh, witness that and to see that you know I, I, I try very hard not to look at any of the, the images because it really affects me on a cellular level and I can't really have that go on for me in my life so I limit that but I did see that, uh, that, that unfortunate situation and when he was you know screaming and crying out for his mother it it broke my heart as it did every mother across the country and the the world and it's like you have to be a very sick individual to ever think that that like why are you not getting up why aren't you you know why are you putting applying more pressure what is going on in your brain that in your heart in your mind that is creating this why are you doing this it's because you think that you can get away with it not only did he think he can get away with it, he felt he had gotten away mm-hmm. with it. And that's the thing about bullying. Bullies don't feel that they are doing anything wrong in their own mind. Mm-hmm. It's all about control. He was looking for control, for dominance. Mm-hmm. And also, as you said, it was to prove a point that no one who's watching can do anything to me. I'm the one that has the power. Absolutely. And, and that is what we have to look at going back. It was something in him that festered and came to the surface. When our young people were acting up and acting out, it's something in them that's festering. I said this yesterday to a gentleman. I said, you, you watch movies and watch TV. What child is in charge of the programming that we have on TV? What child is in control of the movies that are being made? What child is in control of the music that is being p- produced? No child. That means there's some adults who are putting that out to put it into our young people's heads that is okay. When they watch TV, and, and I'm telling you, the viewing audience and your, those of you who are listening, watch television, you'll see this happening almost so 98% of the programs. Somebody's going to have a drink in their hand to co- comfort themselves, always pouring a drink. To relax. Somebody's going to have a gun and somebody's going to be going to bed. Three things you're always going to find on most programs. A gun, booze, and beds. Mm. This is what our children are seeing. And remember, they see it and it's programmed into them. If you want to relax, take a drink. If you need to defend yourself, get a gun. And if you love him or her, have some sex. Is there something wrong with that? Am I wrong? Am I seeing it wrong? You guys help me. Tell me. Well, I don't watch TV. However, I agree with the program, and the programming starts with that. You can't spend hours and hours and hours watching television. You can't spend hours and hours and hours playing video games. We have, you know, a, a set time frame, a, a screen time in our house, and it's very it's very well monitored, right? So there's a there's a like a, a particular kind of kids programming that you can watch um, for 30 minutes, you know, as long as all the chores are done, as long as all the things are you know completed. You have to have a level of responsibility and accountability, even wow. as a child. See, so you're saying what parents need to be saying, yeah, and need to be doing, yeah. But are they doing it? Because most parents. Let the TV rate. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Somebody say, you know what? I've had a hard day. Go get your tablet. Go get your cell phone. And let the cell phone teach you. Let the, pa- uh, the tablet teach you. I don't have time. So when the home is being destroyed, go on, Art, you, you want to say something? The home is being destroyed. What are we doing? I think there's one big question there mm-hmm. is to be able to show responsibility in the house. And when we were coming up, there was responsibility. Uh, 
but didn't say it was something the girl did or the guys did like this here, taking out the trash, uh, cleaning up the house, being responsible. You have to put responsibility on them. You go back to the women when you talk about you have these kids, these babies, by unresponsible people. So what are you going to get? An unresponsible? No response. Mm-hmm. I hear an individual talk about a guy, he works with him, and this guy's just fantastic uh, working with his hands. Got five or six babies that he don't take care of. It goes back. What kind of man do you want, young lady, that shows no responsibility and stuff? So he's leaving you, and nobody has no responsibility because you're not getting the help, and you're not preaching responsibility. If you don't take out the trash, if you don't do this, this, and this, forget about going up to John Adams and playing basketball. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Taking that away from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or oh, whatever you want to do. I'm going to take that away from you. Sit down and relax. But that's back down in the 30s and the 40s. They don't do that in they, 2021. Yes, absolutely. Well, they, they, but they are. they're still <laughs> the 30s and 40s. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can come up a little bit more. Come up to the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, but it's still the one word, the key, is responsibility. Sure. We must curate and have responsibility for your kids, but first of all, for you as an adult. So realistically, we all have some capability in the process of things that are going on. Absolutely. Uh, being responsible, you, uh, Gwen, you said, you know, my child is not going to do certain things. Th- there's some responsibility Absolutely. that goes with that. And today we don't have many parents. And I know some parents are going to hit me up later on and say, who are you to tell me I'm doing the best I can? You know what? The best you can sometimes mean I need some help. Absolutely. That's when you doing all you can do, then get some help doing the rest of it. We don't do that. We don't want to uh, come across that I'm uh, needy. We all need some help. And it's good when you have some women, such as yourself, Gwen, out here who can help teach younger women that you don't have to do certain things. You don't have to be bullied into certain things. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. It starts with us as parents. What are we going to do to offset the the Derek Shelvins out there? All these folks out here doing things that we know are wrong. They may not see it as wrong among themselves, but we have to help them see that what you are doing is not acceptable. The courts finally got it right with him when they said, hey, that was murder. But see, we're going to be, be lulled into the sense of comfort now. Some of us, because we say, hey, they got it right. They convicted him. He's going to jail. But he's only one. Out of we it. have to help change mindsets. Mm-hmm. How do we help change the bully mindset that is permeating our country? It's entered into our home. Go on. No, I just, when you, I think that they, of course they got it right. But I also think that they factored in, the, factored in that they were going to tear that place apart. Minnesota. If they hadn't. You know, it, and so I think that they said, listen, you got to go. You, you're going to have to go down. You have to go down, and you're going to have to get the most time. You're going to have to get the, We're going to have to see the whole dramatics of you being handcuffed, led out. You're going to have to go in general population. You're going to have to get, you're going to be the one, the sacrificial lamb in this. Cause now, now let's take what you just said, which is scary, mm-hmm. dangerous, but oftentimes happen. Mm-hmm. What if he didn't get that? As you said, Minnesota would have been torn up, but you know what would have been? Black folks going down into black communities, tearing up black people's stuff, and then justifying and say, hey, he got off. But you just destroyed a community because of this one man. So that mindset is still there that we have to look at. How do we, we got that one right. We got all these others yet to, to, to deal with, but we also have us to deal with. As you mentioned earlier, what a, my child, I don't want my child to go down that path. If you don't want your child down that path, what are you doing to offset them going down that path? To, to back up just a little bit, mm-hmm. just a little bit. When you, when you have, think about this. You have a, a single mom. She might have a couple different children, and they may have a couple different dads. 
throughout the day, she has to uh, work and come home, take care of the kids, take care of the homework, take care of the dinner, take care of the bath time, take care of the story time, take care of the clothes and all the things. And then she still has to have time for resting and preparing herself for all of the things that's going on. And there is no man present. And the man not being present to take off some of the load, maybe he can get the kids ready, maybe he can do whatever it is. The balance is off. So the balance is off. She's she's irritable. Mm-hmm. She's probably has some type of um, deficiency, mineral deficiency. She's probably not even eating the right way. She's probably not doing the things she needs to do to take care of herself first. She's probably not get, having a chance to go exercise and walk and build her serotonin. She's probably not even aware that serotonin is, you know, an issue for her. Uh, we have to start there. We have to start there. So with that being said, mm-hmm. when that, there's no man, she has this long litany of things that she has to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want the women to understand, too, there's some men have those long, long litany of things to do, course. too. Single parents. Exactly. Single yeah, parents single have parents. to go through that. So what it what it's going to take is what we've always said time and time again. It takes a village, village to raise a child. When you don't have the man in the home, if you don't have the woman in the home, we have a village. There are people that we should be able to go to and say, hey, can you help me? I need some help. I need a vacation for my kids for an hour or so. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that. What we do is turn to drugs, alcohol, sex, and other things that simply say that's going to compensate. It doesn't compensate. It doesn't help us. It's a mindset that we have to look at. How do I help this young lady or this young man change how they feel, number one, about themselves? Because if I don't like me, I guarantee you I don't like you. And the kid feels that. Absolutely. That, that, the, the children feel that. They, have, they are lacking in uh, feeling, emotional. They, they're, they're feeling rejected a lot of the times. And the underlining thing about this is anger. A lot of the children who are out and about just, you know, they're angry. They're upset. They're mad. Somebody is not spending time with them. Somebody is not talking with them. Somebody is not asking them questions. They don't even care what they're doing. They're just out. But I gave you my cell phone. I gave you the iPad. They want time. They want energy. They need an energy exchange. They need to be able to say, Mom, look, this is what happened today. I want, you know, I need, I've heard kids say, "I I need my parent to say something to me. You know, ask me some questions. So what, you, what you're saying, too, in a way is, and, and I know this is true, children will act out because they look for attention from an adult, someone to say, that's the way you show me you care. Mm-hmm. When we let our children get away with everything, we have a Derek Chauvin mm-hmm. in the making. Because all that we internalize. Mm-hmm. And children are going to internalize. The young man who went to the school and, and, and shot it up. Why? He internalized a lot of the hurt that he had. And he had that bully mentality. I'm hurt, so I'm going to hurt somebody. somebody else. Sure. Do, do we really care? That's It's coming down to that. Do we really care or is it just conversation? Mm. Well, I know from my in my own experience, I have, like I said, and I mentioned earlier, I have a, a lot of hats and the thing, a lot of things that I do. And sometimes, because I also homeschool my daughter, sometimes I can get so tunnel vision in my work and she's like, mom, I want to play with, you know, (laughs) and then I have to say, you know what, you're right. Let me take a step back from this. This can wait. And then I I focus on whatever it is that she needs. However, I also help to balance that by saying, listen, every single thing in the world is not going to revolve around you. So this is an opportunity for you to learn that patience is key. Sometimes it's appropriate for you to have all of the attention and all of the things, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we have to handle business, and sometimes. So those boundaries, mm-hmm. that's a big part of this, too. There are some boundaries. And so she now understands, okay, we have a set time that we're going to work together and do something fun. Mom and I are going to do something. It was just mom and I. It's, she's going to turn her phone off. She's not looking at her phone. I'm not looking at my, uh, it's not screen time for me. And we're going to focus on whatever it is we need to focus on. And so that takes time. That takes, you know, that I had to learn a couple times, you know, I had to put my, I have to put myself out there in this situation and say, this was a, a negative experience at first, but I took it as a teaching moment. So I've never been a mother before. She's never been a daughter before. So we have to learn each other and we're not taking enough time 
collectively to do that. We're having babies and babies and babies and babies and buying all the kid clothes and tennis shoes and having all the beautiful parties and all the things, but we're not connecting with our children. And that's a big issue, too. So you set aside this time. Did your mom connect with you on those particular things? She did in, in, in certain ways. It was a little different back then, though. You know, parenting has changed <laughs> over the years. Just a, just a lot, huh? <laughs> just, just, just a tiny little bit. You know, my mom, she did an excellent job um, of raising us and I think taking care of us and doing all the things that she thought she needed to do at, the, at that time. And so what I've done is taken from my experience as a, a kid growing up and okay, now I have a daughter. Here are some things I can do a little differently. Here are a couple things that, you know, my mom had, she worked for the post office for 30 some odd years. And so she had to be somewhere at six o'clock in the morning, you know? So uh, my situation is a little different. So of course my experience is going to be a little different. I'm a stay at home mom. I work from home. My business is run from home. And so I can take a little bit of time, a little bit more time, and say, hold on, we got, we, we need an hour or two. You know what I mean? I can step away from this work. Yes, it's pressing. Yes, I might stay up till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning to make up for that time, but that's that's what has to happen. I'm a mother. And, and I know so, that when you think about it, uh, and we said it last week too, children didn't ask to be born. They didn't. And yet we treat them like, oh, you know, you've been here all this time, all your life. No, I didn't ask to be born. Therefore, since I, I'm here, you have a responsibility to me. Mm-hmm. And, and as, as difficult as that might be sometimes for us as parents, we have a responsibility to our children to be in their lives. Be present. Exactly. And then, you, again, you're hitting the nail on the head. To be present means not just there. Mm-hmm. Can I sit with my dad and share with him? If I'm in the house and my children are saying I'm going down the street and they're always down the street talking to Mr. Mr. B down there because he can't talk to me. Something's wrong at home. Absolutely. The children, are, they're crying out to us. Hey, I need some attention. Will you listen to me? Well, boy, it's not that important right now. Mm-hmm. It is important. Mm-hmm. When are we going to prioritize our children? Mm-hmm. Last week we were talking about uh, uh, children, too, being collateral damage a few weeks ago. And we look at it now. Children are still collateral damage. We don't have the emphasis on our children as it should be because we are, we are buying them off by giving them things. Again, we have the end result. We can have a cop who has been abused as a child grow up with that animosity and that hate and that resentment in them and will kneel on somebody's neck for nine and a half minutes and snuff the life out of them. That did not happen by accident. Sure. That was a seed that was planted that grew in him that he felt comfortable in doing what he did. Mm-hmm. And if we look at that and, and with disdain and say, man, look what he did. That's, I hate that he did that. It's still going on in homes around the country. Mm-hmm. How are we going to change? We can't change what happened to this man, to George Floyd. But we can change what can happen to t- children growing up today. Now, what are we planning in these young men and women's lives that they don't have to grow up and be a bully or have a bully's mentality? What are we doing about that? Mm. Well, I can tell you what one organization is doing and what we've done is to be able to go into schools as a mentoring program, being invited in and let these kids see that there are men who care. There are men who are in positions, and I just couldn't even fathom that individual when you talk about a president or CEO of a company or director of marketing here. They're all here, and we've heard more than once or twice going into these schools that individuals, the individual over the mentoring program will ask, what did you get out of this? I got out that these men care about me. And some of them come up and ask and say, you know, I wish you were my father. So those are things that can be found. And you can start at your own school. And that's the principle. What kind of mentoring program do we have? Well, let's find some mentoring program with some positive individuals coming in here, some grandfathers or fathers, whatever the case, so these kids can see. This is what I have to look for. 
this is what it's supposed to be about. So that's one way we can negate the bullying aspect if we are in their lives and in a positive way. Absolutely. And showing that I care. Okay. So when we care, how do we show we care other than just saying, I care about you? We can feed them good food. <laughs> we can start there. We can eliminate a lot of this sugar. The sugar rots your brain. <laughs> it rots your brain more than uh, the, the drug cocaine does. If you put, you know, you've seen it, I'm sure. The, uh, the experiment with the, the mice, they went, they had the sugar and they had the cocaine. And the mice went to the sugar and OD'd on the sugar. To the, didn't even look at the cocaine. Okay, and so they were drawn to it and affected by it. That's a big thing. And if you wake up in the morning and you're having pop tarts, juicy juice, and then you're saying you're going to school and they say, "Sit down, don't move, don't say anything, be quiet, listen and learn for eight hours." To what? How can you? I don't. Your your brain is saying it's going crazy. Now, what happens when the teacher sees that? Shut up, sit down. They become bullies. And they're all right because, it, hey, sit down, boy, be still. Mm-hmm. And that kid's on a sugar high, a sugar rush. Sugar rush. Again, we need to, uh, we look at problems, but we don't see solutions. Mm-hmm. And we need to start looking at the solutions. We have to reverse engineer ourselves. What are we doing? How am I contributing to the destruction of my children? It's hiding in plain sight for us. And if one of the simplest things that we could do is change how we are eating, are we drinking enough water? Are children drinking enough water? Are they getting enough rest? Are you turning off the electronics? Are you, you know, creating a a space of rest for them? Are they listening to something that gives them a calm sense? You know, are you, what are we doing collectively? You know, so I think it starts there too. It, there again, you going back to reverse engineering. Mm-hmm. We have to go back to where the home. Yes, we have to go back to the home. Whatever that home is, that's where everything is, is being indoctrinated, is being taught. You, we can't unplant seeds that have been planted. Sure, we can't say you can apologize all day and say I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you've already caused the harm. It's better not to cause the harm than cause the harm and say now nah, I'm going to apologize for it. You, because that scar that you caused, that scar that is there, is not going to go away. So we need to be proactive and not reactive. That's it. And if we're proactive, that means I'm in my home thinking about the best thing for that child or those children. Mm-hmm. If it means getting rid of all the electronics, you give them an hour on electronics. And that's it. It shouldn't be, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm tired. So you get another hour. Mm-hmm. That hour turns into two, then three, then four. And we expose our children to alcohol. We expose them to drugs. We ex- and the swearing, because that's another thing. It's all over TV and everything now. And the kids are swearing like sailors. We're giving them negative things and expect positive results. Go on, somebody, you got, the floor is yours. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, you know, listening to and, and hearing what you're saying, I, you know, I'm just letting it marinate a little bit because I think that, here's the thing, the, the best apology is changed behavior. You can't tell me over and over and over again, I apologize, I apologize, and, and not do anything different. And so we, I wanted to touch on that first, and then also I wanted to say, being a parent is is a challenge. I'm careful with my words because I believe mm-hmm. words are powerful. Mm-hmm. It's a challenge. It is a challenge for me. And I just have a six-year-old. And some people say, you don't even qualify. You only got one kid and she's six and da 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 However, it is a challenge. And it can be, especially as a stay-at-home mom, as a, you know, a business owner and all the things, right? At the end of the day, Everybody has uh, some accountability, especially Mm -hmm. with what we're going through right now. And if we're breaking down everything, there is no one person to blame. There is no one situation to blame. We all have to take accountability and we all have to take responsibility. Nowadays, it's difficult to even correct a child 
in public if they're doing something because then here comes the mama. Who you think you talk? Na, 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 and you're not gonna. And then the whole village. That aspect goes out the window. However, I have in times past had to uh, redirect someone of a different culture when she was talking to a group of young black men, uh, young black boys who were in a gross in a uh, drugstore. They were simply trying to buy uh, some candy bars or something. And she was talking so crazy to them. And I, I happened like, who, what? her tone was crazy. I said, excuse me, who are you talking to? Well, I don't appreciate what I said, but who are you speaking to? Are you talking to them? Because would you like someone to speak to your children in the same way? Well, are you their mother? It doesn't matter. I'm here now. And what you're not going to do is speak to them in that tone and in that way. Now, if you have a problem, you can address it with me. She was done. But had I not been there, she would have tried to berate those young men. And so I told them, I said, I'm glad that you all didn't say anything, you know, negative, and they didn't incite it and, you know, cuss her out, because they could have, <laughs> and probably could have jumped her, and, you know, all it could have went way left. But we have to, I think, take personal responsibility mm-hmm. in each situation. Of course, you have to act with some some, some decorum. You have to discern what's, what's appropriate. However, we have our own individual accountability and responsibility we're coming to the close we are down to about like three minutes left but uh, what you said that accountability we are accountable whether we want to be or not we are accountable and i'll say this because you know we'll talk about it later on and some other upcoming programs i have my five children all my five children are adults Mm -hmm. and i always tell people it's not easy being a parent but it is rewarding Mm -hmm. you have to take the good and the bad together and sometimes you might want to you feel like i got to go in the room and cry then you get yourself together and come back out there and deal with the issues that's what this is all about this program is about unlocking the power of you and what we want from people you can't release the power in you until you recognize that power is about you Mm. and when it comes out you means you're in control of the destiny and the destination of that power and that's what we want. This is to help people understand what this is all about. And before we leave, because I know I, I have a new book coming out. I'm going I'm to throw that in here real quick in my last minutes or so. We have a new book coming out that is appropriate for the time. I don't know if you can see that. Well, I have to hold it up. Here, I'll hold it up. It's called Lynching Rope No Longer Required. And it's dealing with the... Um, Unarmed killing of black men, women, and children. We talk about George Floyd in the book, and we talk about any number of other people in this particular book. So it's coming out in May. It's ready. I'm just reviewing certain things, but this book is very relevant and thought-provoking, and I want you to get a copy of it. Maybe we'll give away a few copies of it coming up in May. So as we're about to close... Ms. Gwen, do you have anything you want to say in, in closing? I just, um, you know, I offer a, a collective prayer for all of our um, black children, black boys, black girls, black men, black women, uh, especially, you know, because uh, we're, in, we're in, a, in a crazy time. We're in a crazy time now, and I just, I think that we need to approach things with a little bit more love and a mm-hmm. little bit more care, and I wish that we all do that. Um, this was an insightful um, conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me and being a part of this because uh, I've learned a couple of things, you, you know, just being here today and uh, I'm thankful ultimately. So, you know, hopefully we'll have a better um, situation in moving forward in the future. I'm not going to put any money on it, <laughs> but, you know, hopefully. All right. Absolutely. Mr. Finley, last Account- words. Accountability. That's what we have to look at. And I'm so happy to have an opportunity for you to come in and participate with us. But accountability, and that's what was happening in Minnesota, individuals' accountability. If they haven't stood up and did what they did, this would have never happened. Well, we, we need to thank God for that 17-year-old girl who had the presence of mind to record everything that she Absolutely. did. So that is something monumental. It's something we can build on. There's hope for a lot of young people out there. So until next week, be safe.